Nato Thompson, uh, Chief Curator of Creative Time, and on behalf of Creative Time and uh, Public Art Agency to speak, Magdalena Baum, I want to thank everyone for coming out uh, tonight for this discourse meets party atmosphere. <laughs> Trying to prove that art and politics isn't completely dour all the time. Um, a few thank yous to begin. We want to thank uh, Berlin Biennial for allowing us to somewhat symbiotically uh, suck some juice and energy out of the biennial opening day. It's so great, so thanks to them. Um, also, just um, this is a, a partnership between Creative Time and Public Art Agency Sweden. So, besides myself and Magdalena, we also have uh, some of our staff here to put this together Laura Reykjavik, Sally Swed, Lisa Rodenthal, and Eddie Muka. So, thanks to them too for helping us out with this. And also, just so you know, we're going to have some serious discourse, as one does. And then, up there, we will be having Planning to Rock, who will be rocking this room, so stick around for that, that's going to be amazing. <laughs> yeah, give it up, come on. <laughs> A little bit about the format, we're going to try to keep this fairly parsimonious. I'm going to speak for five minutes, each of us will speak for five minutes. Um, the artists here, we have... Um, Jonas Stahl and Amit Oken, as well as curator Joanna Warsaw. We'll be talking about specific projects because sometimes when we talk about art and politics, we talk so theoretical, everyone sits around and goes, is there any art to actually any of this? So we want actual projects um, as a methodology. We'll talk for about five minutes each, and then we're going to have a little discussion amongst ourselves. And then we will then open it up to you carefully. It'll be an open question. You guys ask questions and we'll have a discussion. And when that gets exhausting, we'll cut it off and plan to rock and come on. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, this is also an opportunity to um, give a taste of the um, summit, the Creative Time Summit that is actually being co-presented with Public Art Agency Sweden in Stockholm. It's up November 14th and 15th. And we have an email list going around somewhere. I highly suggest if you're going to go up there to reserve tickets, Early, it always sells out, and then my Facebook's full of people begging me to get in, and I need it. <laughs> so just for my own sake, no, but it's also, it's going to be a great event. Let me just tell you something about Creative Time, too, the Creative Time Summit. This is our fifth year of um, doing something. Something about Creative Time, not all of you may know what we are. We're a public arts organization based in New York City. Um, I've been there for eight years now, and not only do we do public as in terms of public space, but also public as a kind of politics, both in terms of points of intersection for who the audience is for art, but also as a kind of politics around democracy and agency, as a kind of method of not only doing projects, but also five years ago we started the Creative Time Summit. And initially, the Creative Time Summit was just an attempt to legitimate a certain kind of artwork we might call public practice or art and politics, to be kind of simple about it. But to reinsert that kind of discourse into New York City, which maybe some of you have heard has a fairly sizable commercial market that has this gravitational pull that sucks everything into it at times. So we were trying to kind of undo some of that inertia and to produce a space to kind of legitimate a form of art that I think has become extremely widespread. Um, the kind of methodologies of working that I've heard referred to as institutional critique 2.0 to uh, social practice, to social engaged art, to public practice, to a myriad of projects that are interested in the lived landscape of our lives as a space of cultural production. Um, politics and art fuse into kind of similar methodology. We've been doing it for five years. The first year was very art worldly, I would say, because you have to kind of get the famous people in so the art people take it seriously. And then you sneak the anarchists in, and you sneak the kind of more radical politics in as you go each year, and I think of it like a kind of calisthenics, where we're trying to stretch the muscles of the art world to get used to things that aren't in their safe discourse. So we try to sneak in things like just straight up activist projects or collectives who actually do not want any social capital or fame out of their work and really like to be anonymous, and try to kind of spread the presentation of people to an ecosystem that more properly reflects the radical dynamism and ecology of an art politics world. And it's been really fun. And um, this year we're actually coming across the Atlantic to the not as privatized sphere as our own homeland, though you are trying to mimic us, and I apologize for that. Um, and we're interested in this kind of 
what we're trying to do with the summit, and I think just to, yeah, I'll turn over to Meg Lynch shortly, um, is not only have a place where we have a discourse, but to also produce spaces where a community of people interested in the intersection of art politics can not only get to know each other, but can produce new structures. And of course, you know, over the last 15 years, we've seen biennials pop up, we have seen art fairs pop up, and each one of them has their own kind of methodologies and politics and things like that. Um, but we also want to have a kind of ongoing space, and this isn't the only one, but to really call a space where we can start to produce new structures, radical structures, that uh, are dynamic, that are exciting, that produce critical ways to reflect not only the kind of what, whether or not things are art question, but I think more radically ways in which cultural producers can transform the landscape of the given political environment. That is a radical project, and it's actually, strangely enough, which we will talk about in New York City, you know, it used to seem like this crazy idea, and now we've got, um, in our town, a guy named Tom Finkelpearl, who was the director of the Queens Museum of Art, and now become a director of cultural affairs in the city, with a really interesting kind of model of civic engagement and heterogeneous approaches across immigrant groups and, you know, around languages, and trying to think about a kind of politics of art that is, in fact, reflective of a truly radical civic agenda, who's also in a position of power in the city. This is not some sort of... Uh, ancillary kind of radical project, but in fact something that the government itself is taking quite seriously. And we're taking this notion quite seriously that in fact art politics has something to offer, not just the art world, but in fact the lived landscape of politics as we know it. So that's what we're trying to do. And um, like I said, the Crave Time Summit's coming to uh, Stockholm November 14th and 15th. And we're really encouraging you folks to come out. We're going to have a really dynamic conversation here. I'll turn it over to that guy. Thanks. Um, yes. Uh, it, this is uh, so exciting because I feel we are we are up here sharing this this uh, work on doing the summit, but I also see in the audience uh, this extended family of other people sharing the same kind of interest and engagement, uh, which which is really really great. Um, I started as director of the Public Art Agency of Sweden, which is the national body to work with public commissioning, um, one and a half years ago. Before then, I started and ran an organization called Mobile Art Production Map, where I invited artists to do specific commissions, not necessarily in public space, but trying to, to formulate a new structure where I saw that the institutional structures um, is not actually following the ways that artists work. So I wanted to uh, build an organization where we could follow the way the artists were working and producing the works and exhibiting them in the places and situations and contexts that fitted those works and that were actually made up specifically for those works. And uh, one and a half years ago I was asked to take over this state organization, um, state agency, uh, that has existed for 80 years. And I thought it was a super interesting challenge to think if I started doing the map experiment to see how can we change the structures uh, to because the structures that we have will allow for different artistic pro pro processes and, and uh, what comes out will be changed depending on how we can work with the artists and the artworks. So I was interested in is it possible to step into a state administration and turn it around in a similar manner, not to make a second map, but to see how can we work with <coughs> not with uh, public art as a genre, as it almost has become, uh, in terms of the sculpture we see in the square. How can we instead look at what the artists are actually doing in, with the public space, with the notion of the common, what's already out there, and how, what are the issues, what are the burning issues of our public spaces and the notion of the public. Um, and how can we depart in that, and then build an organization, rebuild our entire organization in a way that allows us to work with what's actually there, what practices that artists have. So now we've just kind of settled in a new form where we are, have temporary projects as a heart, which is like where we discover freely uh, the relationship between public space and, and contemporary art. But we also work with, with applied situation where we work with urban development projects where we can step into structures where actually um, uh, we have um, civil engagement. We can, we can uh, also because we are a government agency, it's possible to step into other structures and affect things and provide platforms in new ways. And where the, it's not the artwork that's central, it's like the thinking and the criticality 
um, that is allowed to come into those uh, civic processes or the, or the processes of, of developing a society. Uh, but these two can't exist without each other, we need both of them. And in this questioning, what can our public space be? What are the issues for, for, for the public spaces around us? Um, it was, we work locally in Sweden, we're national, but it was really important to make this analysis in a wider international context. So this collaboration with Creative Time is a way of understanding between Stockholm and New York, but also because the summit gathers 40 different participants from all other, over the world. Do we even talk about the same thing when we say public space? Um, how can we relate to this? What kind of practices can we involve? Um, so this is one of the many kind of international links that we are developing, and I think for us, for the both organisations, we felt that this was really the benefit of kind of having to shift your mind and having to think differently, because only if you know what's happening around you, you can actually understand more clearly what you need to do in your own kind of in your own country or your own city. Um, and we're so excited to have you three here, uh, Joanna, uh, Ahmed and Jonas. So I'll hand over to Jonas, who's talking? No, to Ahmed, who's talking. some countries, like in the UK, some people wait for 10, 15 years or 20 years in 
order to get their papers done and finally they can get back to their profession that they have to really study or uh, um, it will never be possible uh, really to practice it again. So we want to do it right away and Silent University is uh, behind the idea of Silent University is that and the other idea to bring together three types of organization, not to limit ourselves with art institutions uh, that has its own uh, limitations, but also collaborate with edu educational platforms, academies and community organizations and how uh, to bring these three types of institutions and make things possible and find creative ideas uh, around that. So there are a couple of principles we try to establish and everybody um, it's a big just taking project, uh, organization and everybody else involved. It's not like lifetime commitment only from my side or every other participants, but every institution basically involved with it. And they should not have a deadline or a limited time or uh, this known uh, structure that's usually a commitment of three months, six months or one year. What? One minute? One minute. <laughs> okay, so we have lectures that... Uh, so you can see some of the images here. So I just have to tell you about the, the principles. Urgency is very important. This project came out of urgency. Sustainability, that's something that we have no idea how to deal with in art world. Uh, continuity is the same. Uh, demand with principles and how to establish responsibility and trust locally. These are very important uh, principles of the project. Do I have still 30 seconds? Yes. Uh, so how we can actually think of an education as a school, an academy that doesn't have a uh, based on, it's not based on one single language or one single background or uh, this kind of known, uh, uh, let's say, a demand. It, it's a demand for decentralized and participatory horizontal model of education instead of oppressive, authoritarian, centralized and... It's okay, you know. yes, okay, so it's now it's my time for my five minute, five minute marathon. Uh, in the context of extended practices, that is the main theme of the debate tonight, I want to speak about the concept of parliament in relationship to artistic practice and the occupation of parliament, the idea of parliament, as a potential public domain. I want to start, uh, I'll have two case studies, so hold on to your timer. The first uh, is a project called Beyond Allegories, initiated with the Labour Party element of Arts and Culture in Amsterdam, and fellow artist Hans van Houwelingen and the curator Anne Meester, which consisted of a debate, a seven hour debate, between artists and politicians and union leaders and universities and theatre makers and refugee organizations and many, many more journalists, NGOs, in the Parliament of Amsterdam, led by uh, several resolutions, propositions that were developed by artists and politicians together on the role of art in governance, in political mobilization, in action, art in relationship to transparency, social security. They developed resolutions together, debated it in the Parliament with all of these different uh, representatives of different notions of politics. We try to explore the space of Parliament as a space for progressive meetings between uh, different political entities, not only parliamentary, but also non-parliamentary in nature. So, here, the concept of Parliament is not so much a goal in itself, it's a means through which you come to establish and explore different models of representation, with art as the leading uh, context. And I think that when it comes to the concept of representation, this is where art and politics meet at the most fundamental level. So this is about reoccupying the concept of parliament and the potentiality of parliament. And a very good example is my colleague Anatol Good sitting here, who spoke uh, together with uh, Yunus Osman Noor, and the representative of We Are Here, a refugee collective of 225 members that organized themselves as a political group demanding collective citizenship for the last 16 months. It's the first time in Dutch history that the group uh, of refugees recognized itself as a political entity, undocumented. Together they presented the demand to recognize undocumented political parties equal to documented political parties, as well as proposed uh, science university as a model that recognizes the right to education as much as the right to educate undocumented and documented uh, alike. 
the result of which is going to be a special hearing uh, in September, during which uh, the project of I met the project of I met developed with Yunus uh, Osmanur will debate will be continuing uh, debated in Parliament. The second example, am I on my perfect two and a half minutes? Well, it's perfect. I was in my hotel room practicing in front of the mirror, like timing myself. Can I make this in five minutes? Perfect. So the second project that I want to discuss with you is uh, the New World Summit. Uh, which I have to discuss here because two years ago, during the previous uh, Berlin Biennial, together with Joanna and Warsha, it had its first edition that took place. Since then, uh, many more followed. The New World Summit is an artistic and political organization that tries to develop alternative parliaments, new parliamentary structures throughout the world to facilitate what I would like to refer to as extended democratic practice or extended democratic performances by involving political organizations that in the current political realm, do not have, are not acknowledged as legitimate political entities. Mainly, uh, we're working with stateless organizations and blacklist organizations. And of course, the perversity is that many blacklist organizations, or follow prosecuted as terrorist organizations, are already stateless. Think of the Kurds or of the Basques. And then, when blacklisted, are reduced stateless again because passports are reduced, travel bans imposed, etc., etc. So we have attempted to explore. For the first time here in Berlin at Sophien uh, on May 4th and 5th in 2012, we facilitated uh, different political representatives of the National Democratic Front of the Philippines, uh, Musa Asarit, on the top right of the National Liberation Movement of Azawad, Tuareg Led Rebellion, Continuous, Kurdish Women Movement, Basque Independence Movement, and since we have continued to work as a nomadic parliament trying to facilitate here, for example, Professor Jose Maria Sison founder of the Communist Party of the Philippines, lives in exile in the Netherlands, cannot travel because he is blacklisted. So we literally moved the infrastructure of the New World Summit, of the Alternative Parliament, to him in order for him to confront several key representatives of political organizations, counter-terrorist organizations, um, that are responsible for his blacklisting, for his positioning, for his placement outside of the field of democracy. And of course, that latter concept, that latter idea, the idea that there is such a thing as an outside or a limit to democracy is what we oppose. We explore the field of art as a space where we try to enact limitless democracy, redefine the democratic project as an extended political practice. Uh, in September, in this parliament, in the Flemish uh, Royal Theatre, where else, uh, we'll have the fourth New World Summit with 20 stateless organizations reflecting on the future of the nation-state, the supranational construct, and the concept of statelessness in the wake of the EU elections. Working on, on it in Berlin was, of course, working in pretty safe zone and looking 
rather at the changes that were happening out there and bringing or reflecting them in Berlin. And now uh, somehow completely opposite happened. So I was invited to work in, in Russia with Kasper Koenig. I was rather expecting that this is going to be probably the most, or not very political project that I'm going to be involved in. And actually, uh, uh, just, just, just opposite happened. Actually, the, the, the main questions of the seventh Berlin Biennale are, I guess, now checked, being checked on the ground in St. Petersburg. And uh, so what I just wanted to say, what you'll probably uh, be curious to ask is like, how that how uh, is institution reacting to such a situation as uh, as the current uh, political crisis, Russian and Ukrainian crisis, and uh, and what do you do? So of course, uh, together with the artists, uh, I'm, I'm working with around 12 artists for the public program commissions. We face the situation, so we started to ask ourselves what to do. You know, the question of engagement or disengagement. So how do you engage? When do you disengage? When is the moment that you step out? Uh, and also, why do you go on? And um, and one of the reasons, somehow, to, to, that we decided to, to stay is that we believe that in such situations, the institution probably should go on because otherwise, it's also playing into kind of escalation. But you go on disturbed by this, what is happening. So you go on somehow sensitive, sh showing certain sensitivity and responsiveness, context responsiveness to the situation. I'm bringing this. Uh, so, I mean, that was, as you know, in last years with the Istanbul Biennial, uh, it was a similar situation, you know, how, how this institution is reacting, and there was also a question of public program that on one hand was cancelled, but on the other hand adapted through the grassroots and local initiatives to, 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 to the situation. Uh, and so this, uh, this photo from the protest, uh, I mean, I'm bringing this photo because this is a protest that happened, legal protest, uh, the legal action that happened uh, in St. Petersburg last uh, week, uh, and um, it's also to, to show certain misconception. I mean, absolutely not defending the, the Putin regime, and it's a, it's a, a trap, of course, to, to, to be uh, critical towards the West. But one of the reasons we are guess, staying there is also to, to see the certain misconception or certain uh, Westocentric uh, superiority feeling uh, towards the East and towards the fact that maybe we should just step out of being in Russia, you not know, pretend Russia is not there. So. Um, uh, I'm bringing also this, this, this picture because, as you can see, there is very few people. Uh, and one of the looking at the actually at the Soviet uh, uh, sphere, you think that the lack of political engagement and the lack of participating in the protest is very much, of course, a Soviet legacy. And then one of the questions that comes when you work in the public space: Can art then become kind of an agent that that bring, brings people together or brings? Uh, certain phantasma of getting together and having a political agenda. You know, if you are not going, if you are afraid for different reasons to go to the protest, can you actually come uh, come together under the label of art? I guess in Yona's protest, we are coming also under the label of art in both your projects, uh, somehow as political subjectivities. So, uh, you know, the um, upcoming manifesto will happen on one hand in, uh, in Hermitage, uh, in Winter Palace, and in the general staff building the new wing of Hermitage for the contemporary art. And it's, it's obviously a very vertical space in terms of power. There is a very powerful director, uh, also powerful curator. But on the other hand, there are a multiplicity of programs, also educational program, created by Sebak and Yama, who is here, and Kino program and, uh, and the public program, which is actually, I think, trying to oppose this verticality and spreading horizontality uh, in the horizontal way uh, in the city. And one of the places also that uh, we will be working with is this um, um, house where the famous futurist opera Victory Over the Sun was written. You know, so the very domestic space, the very private space. And when you think, in the, again, in the post-Soviet sphere, where is the public and where is the private? The, the public as the like, not intimidated way of forming your political opinion was very often happening in the private. So we are also playing on this domestic, you know, not public only as we might understand it in the Western discourse. One minute, my God. So, okay. uh, so uh, Nato, you said um, to be uh, practical. So just to show you uh, the map, some curatorial map drawn by Ukrainian artist Alexina Kakhidze. Uh, so all the artists, or many of the artists, most of the artists of the public program are actually happen, um, happen to come or come from the cities that can be reached by train from uh, the oldest train station in St. Petersburg, Vitebsky Vakzal. So they come from Tallinn, Vilnius, 
Kiev, Chisinau, Tbilisi, etc. At the same time, those cities are the capitals of post-Soviet post -Soviet Sweet um, uh, Republic. So the, those artists are particularly sensitive to this situation. And when we first uh, faced the question whether to continue or not, I think one of the reasons was also that we are somehow, and including me coming from Poland, you know, that we are people who are not able to romanticize Russia in any way. You know, we are not able to, to romanticize this experience, but we are close enough to Russia, maybe to, to try to make a point and to try to counter, uh, to counter the hegemonic order and what is, what is going on there now. And maybe uh, one, or just one example of how uh, this is happening. So, as you uh, might know, in Russia today, there is this self-proclaimed Cossacks, militia, Parisia, and like Cossacks are as groups of people that would refer to the originally Cossack culture, but also the guardians of the conservative term, the guardians of conservative um, changes. And Dimitris Narkivichus, the Lithuanian um, artist, somehow looks at who are, who, what is the Cossack culture, who are the Cossacks. And uh, uh, when you, I don't know what would be your association when you think about Cossacks, but my association is that this, this is one of the founding groups of the, Ukra of the Ukrainian culture. Whereas for many others that would be group uh, association would be with the Russian culture. So somehow the Cossack culture is both is, is part of the heritage for both Russian and uh, Ukrainian uh, culture. And Daimantas is proposing, engaging with the academic choirs of Cossack, uh, Cossacks in St. Petersburg and proposing a repertoire of uh, song of war, war songs which are coming both from Ukraine and Russia and staging this uh, choir with the Cossacks. What uh, he's also addressing is that many contemporary art exhibitions, many contemporary art events in Russia now are more and more attacked by the Cossacks. Like the, actually, I mean, this is a famous, you know, iconic image of Pussy Riot being attacked in Russia, in, in Sochi. So, uh, one might also expect Cossacks coming uh, to confront Manifesta because it's, it's kind of hard to believe that Putin will appropriate Manifesta in Ukraine. I don't think he's sophisticated enough for that. So, Cossacks might be there and we are, like Dimentas is proposing this, this step forward to, towards the Cossacks and to enter into dialogue with this uh, current uh, regime in Russia. And etc. I also have some remaining slides. <laughs> Um, thanks everyone. You know, just, just some real quick thoughts. We didn't plan to have so many overlapping themes emerge. They just kind of emerged. We're talking about it over beer today. And this kind of question of infrastructures and agency within infrastructures kept coming up. And we were kind of interested, you know, initially Magdalene and I were going to just present the summit, but then we thought it'd be more fun to think of ourselves as what are our, is our own agency within my own agency as a, as a non-profit that presents public art, or Magdalena's agency within a state agency, or uh, Joanna's work is an independent curator working on biennials, or Ahmed's work is a kind of artist slash cultural organizer slash lifelong project, that's a, quite a commitment, um, organizer, but in terms of your own agency within infrastructures, and then I think Jonas is kind of um, provocation or even pragmatic moving towards a kind of taking on the infrastructures of politics writ large is also an interesting idea. And so I'm kind of turned, I don't have a specific person, but I, I want to kind of think this out loud because we live in a landscape too, which I think is so fascinating, where the city biennial had a boycott. Recently there was a boycott of Gulf labor over Abu Dhabi Guggenheim. And you know, as opposed to staying this defensive, there's a lot of kind of confronting the power simultaneous with the making of power structures that's happening right now. And I think it's calling for us to be somewhat reflexive about our positions within power structures, both aware of the structures that are shaping our, but also our role within those, those structures as well. I don't know if anybody wants to think about, talk about how that's affecting their own life or the way they work, but it certainly seems to be something that's coming up. We are discussing these issues for hours and hours now, like we have little time, uh, uh, based on a lot of misconceptions, we also mentioned some, and I try to make a list of misconceptions and uh, what is being expected from institutions, from artists, uh, anyone who is around those power structures, these power structures, and it's too 
many things actually, misconceptions are the wrong at least, than what could be done or what could be practically achieved. I mean, it's going to look like a, a lot of under, undermining contradiction, undermining public concerns, crisis management not really happening, uh, uh, whitewashing, privatizing, uh, public concerns not happening, uh, uh, no clean money misconception, and solidarity on the street is misconception between institutional structural changes, um, bad government, which one is bad government, good government, which country to do. Not misconception, festivalism is uh, not a misconception. PR departments taking over big events, misconception. Um, <laughs> separating body of work of the artists uh, and and uh, their political position is a big misconception. Uh, a lot of things uh, I can go on uh, forever, and especially the most important, taking financial financial decisions. And curatorial decisions uh, is divided so, so sharply as it is not related, and many crises comes from that. And uh, this decision-making mechanism, how it's become more, how it can become more democratic, and how we can actually stop dividing each other as artists, creators, and people who run the direct world directors of institutions, like how everybody in this country. Can get rid of that decision-making mechanism in a hierarchic way and turn it into a more democratic way, and how we can be more prepared even before the crisis. Not only like we have no idea how to react to crisis, also, and uh, everybody should uh, expect to demand uh, their own business. I, I will get back to uh, what what is expected or what could be done. If anybody else wants to point out some more misconceptions. <laughs> I think the misconceptions you, you mentioned them all now. Um, <laughs> no, what I what I um, what for me is very crucial is to when, when it comes to the place of socially engaged art or extended practices is that for me it is the focus to try to organize something that is more, when you speak of public domains, we organize something that is more than just the debate or just the meeting, but that really engages in the question of infrastructure. And I think that if you take social engagement seriously from an artistic perspective, the types of crises that we are facing with today, whether these are political or economic or ecological, they don't allow anymore to answer with uh, small communes pulling out of the, pulling out or pulling back self-organization, these models are no longer sufficient, simply because the, the very future of infrastructure is threatened by, by issues that are far larger than that. And that means, I think, that the, what has long been a separation held in artistic discourse between politics and the political, the political being the kind of these authentic moments of meeting the public, the public squares that get occupied, the moment of self-organizations which are crucial, are directly connected to questions of politics. That means day-to-day -day infrastructure, proper administration, uh, properly functioning sewers, like from the most banal to the most sublime. These, these things can no longer be separated. And for me that means to attempt in a, that means to attempt to act as much as possible on the moments in the here and now when these moments arrive, when these moments occur. So when we have a chance to bring together different political parties, unions, uh, etc. We immediately took that chance, even though I have an enormous amount of doubts about the space of Parliament, I have an enormous amount of doubts about the structures of Parliament, the structures behind it, the kind of the, the ine inevitable consensus that lies at this basis. But to take every opportunity we have at that moment to try to shape, try to create new coalitions between different progressive components in society, have art as a leading role, while insisting, being pragmatic, while insisting, and this is of course what I, why I the second example on alternative infrastructures that can overcome the political deficits in the here and now. But these cannot only exist in the kind of future scenarios. We cannot endlessly outsource revolution until the until well, I don't know how many books I'll have written, how many exhibitions I've made. We also have to act one way or another in the here and now and use art or the imaginative force of art to build coalitions. And I think the results of the European elections were for me once more an example of that. Uh, the Euro European project itself uh, is at stake when it comes to its reimagination, its future, its, its, its 
potential of a, of a solidary uh, structure, of a structure of solidarity. So, for me, that is, that is the main importance. So, we insist on the pragmatics as much as uh, the imaginative force of art in creating new structures or acting upon the potential future that, that we will inevitably need. I felt like they are making parliament. Sorry? <laughs> I felt like they are making parliament. <laughs> We're trying to do that. You are somehow between a policeman and activist, and at the same time you are operating, of course, within the power structure, and you have to be conscious, maybe, of using the terms and conditions, and especially in such an urgent moment, because then the institution is more vulnerable. And when there are, for example, calls for boycotts, you know, it's actually interesting to see how, uh, for example, the director of Manifest is getting politicized through this situation, you know, and how how the boycotts actually. Uh, shape the institution, so institution is more easy and more eager maybe to rethink and there is a moment of structural change which is possible and uh, yeah, you know, so you are on one hand a policeman and on the other hand you are an activist so you are inside trying to be an activist but also trying to use this in terms of the so I guess, uh, yeah, this is also, I mean, I could speak more about it but this is how I, I see the product productivity of a certain point of terms of point. I think for me, moving from an independent organization to state structures is very much what you were saying. It's, it's uh, having the possibility of actually uh, having a dialogue with, with the Ministry of Social Affairs, for instance, explaining uh, not what they would think of as an artwork with a with frame and a painting, but actually uh, what, what we think of as contemporary art, kind of redefining that. And, and when we talk about that, it's possible to understand what it means and it's possible to explain. Um, that we can use that in, in, in other areas of society where thinking of artists can, can be inserted and that was not possible to do in, as an independent organization but it's possible to do as a state structure or it's easier to do as a state structure. On the other hand there are things that we can't do. I think it's interesting to think about, I mean we can't do the, the, maybe the wildest things we have that need to be somehow uh, putting out different opinions, uh, being kind of uh, not too radical to one side. Um, so I think it's interesting to think about what the different positions allow. For instance, creative time, um, I think it's a shift. It, it wasn't that quite a shift since you started, and also with Laura. And there, it's, so it's also transforming from what it used to be. And you know what's so funny is so we do art politics, and I've learned just to say, I almost want to do a workshop for people that work in institutions that get battered by the activist community for everything they do. Because I think I need some mental health training because I, they're all my friends and they're always hating on me. Um, but just to say, one of the things, just to, just to say in terms of doing art and activist work, or just say art, the work of art and politics, is certain kind of tendencies emerge. One is, of course, and they're reasonable things to be called out, right? Which is, of course, when you work with power, people are going to see some contradictions inherently in your structure. You will be inevitably called out for them. And sometimes you can answer for them and sometimes you can't. You know, it's just the nature of it, and that's somewhat frustrating. Other times, I would say, too, um, you know, one time we did this Creative Time Summit, and we were boycotted. I just got to also say, the activist community is not a... <laughs> they don't talk a lot to each other. So, um, so for example, we had a Creative Time Summit where we were boycotted because we listed... Uh, we have these screening sites across the United States where people screen, like on the screen, they have screening parties of our summit live, and people come and watch. And, one of our partners was in Israel, and then an art group from Cairo, a Mosairine, boycotted it, and then went after all these other summit presenters to boycott our summit because they claimed we were breaking the BDS uh, boycott. And there was a, and it was an interesting discussion, but it wasn't really, uh, it didn't work out very well because it happened on the internet. A lot of misinformation flew around, and then we had to spend most of the summit discussing, trying to clarify the case, and that was very frustrating because. It, it wasn't. A, it was not a nice occasion to talk about the BDS boycott. It also completely dominated the discussion of other things that we were trying to talk about. And then just just another anecdote, which is fun, was we, uh, but kind of tough too. We worked on with an artist named Suzanne Lacey, who did this phenomenal project around equity and gender justice. This incredible, deep, community engaged project with seasoned female activists from around New York City, uh, who 
uh, who, I mean, just people who really had a kind of phenomenal pedigree in terms of activism in the city that were not necessarily out of the arts discourse. We were, we were kind of blindsided by a petition that circulated a week out before the project that said uh, that the activists weren't being paid for their two hours of work and why weren't we providing child care? And then the, the entire media perpetuated the story, which they love, which is the do-gooder artist is in fact has a deep inherent contradiction and they're actually some sort of nightmarish artist. And Suzanne was deeply frustrated and the questions of gender justice were not discussed because the media latched onto this deep controversy within the project. I'm ranting a little bit, but just to say, I think that in some ways, too, in this work, we're, we are all kind of victims, and also forced into a kind of conversation about ethics and pragmatism in our own infrastructures, that is really difficult to tease through, but deeply important for us as well. I say something. Oh, that will take another hour. So I will take a, a quote from David Harvey. Right to the city, and uh, in this book he mentioned if, what if all these op opposition movements come together one day, and then they ask the question, what is the right to the city? And he answered, he says this answer is very simple: creative, democratic, creative, democratic access to the surplus. So what is the surplus? Uh, often institutions. Now I'm going back to the art institutions. Um, excuses, especially when they get sponsored, like in, in, in Sydney, sponsor uh, funded uh, the biennial that that particular sponsor, and later they claim, claim ownership on uh, cultural heritage events called Sydney Biennial. There's a difference. You can even give and support the entire event, but you cannot claim ownership on historical heritage. That is a surplus. And how we claim the surplus collectively all together, it's all ours. So we were asked, like, after he resigned, we went back to the biennial. Oh, actually, we had better chances to do the show. We had more support at the Art Academy, for instance. We had to claim it. It's not someone's biennial. It's cultural heritage, and it's very important. And think, talking about institutions, often they say, uh, well, now where to get the money? You know, how we have to make this events. Uh, if you look at around uh, what are the most respected uh, events, it's not only calculated the amount of budgets they have. There is another uh, currency, a couple of other currencies, friendship, trust, other things that brings credibility and that brings surplus. And surplus is used, misused by institutions like Guggenheim. They go somewhere with no money, but with the brand, and they ask a lot of money for the brand, like in Helsinki they they ask uh, 4 million euros, just to bring the brand, and they have to run their own museum still. So, thinking about this, uh, how it can be actually used uh, in a productive way, like in the case of Manifesta, okay, choosing uh, going to Russia, how we can actually uh, turn the sur surplus, not abusing too, but in a most like something powerful and transformative and actually demanding. So let's not use this word uh, boycott. People who work in factories go to strike. They're not boycotting their own countries and incomes. They, are, they just ask for the right. Taking a position is different than boycotting. You demand. And if the other side refuses, then you take the necessary step and that is the consequences of it. And it has to be done collectively. And it's, there is a, if you look at the work Class, there's a big history of that. It's not that it looks like a new thing in the in the art world, but it also has its history, history uh, in the history of um, big art exhibitions like the and all the other ones. Like if you look at 1950s, 30s, earlier. Um, so I think we should not underestimate the power of a friendship, trust. When you damage the trust, you can never establish it back, and use it as a powerful tool uh, for to make things uh, happen in a transformative way, not like from the beginning saying, of course we are a modest institution, although we are one of the largest in the world, but we are a modest institution and we have no power to change the uh, laws uh, in this particular country or transform the public space and reclaim the public space. No, it is wrong. It's, uh, you have that power and you are aware of that and we just have to use it collectively. Let me just ask now real quick, what if someone says, <laughs> to, to the artist, 
you know, what if someone says, you guys make these infrastructures, just in a cynical note, right? They could say, you make this silent university, but then you go from biennial to biennial, and you get all the social capital out of all of this, right? Like, let's not pretend that there isn't, you're not getting something out of this, right? You get, you get some credibility. What do you say to that, right? Because that is an exchange of sorts. Yeah, uh, of course, every project you do, every, every everything you invest your labor and time and intelligent uh, you know, efforts, everything in it, it brings a surplus same way. So as an artist you are more fragile, but you can also become an institution yourself or imagine yourself as an institution in collaboration uh, with uh, other people. And we, I do collaborate all the time and I only exist through those collaborations, I don't have any institution behind me. So I know the power of it. Uh, and when you have it, you can also misuse it yourself. And I see a lot of artists doing that. Like, it's not on the survey. So every act we take, it's not public. Some of them become public, like in case of Sydney Biennial, and actually should be from time to time to refresh our way of thinking. Like there is this funding structure existing since 30 years. It's old system. It has to change. It will be painful, not easy. Like uh, Maria said, uh, the quote from Gramsci, same thing. Old has been dead, and it's not easy to uh, for, for new to new thing to born. But actually, it can born, and uh, we don't. But there will be this trans, uh, uh, transforming process in between, and it will be painful. And all of us, like if you, if you put yourself in the risk, the other side have to do it as well. So everybody gains some sort of surplus, and it's the heritage. We can call it also heritage as well. I was thinking about the Heritage, but you are actually doing your projects outside of that building. How do you feel? How would you feel if you were? What's the difference of being outside and inside? Is there, is there a difference in, in like in the physicality you can you can achieve? Well, yeah, of course, it's a fundamental difference, I think. And it's the director of the Hermitage, uh, Mr. Piotrowski, actually in the recent interviews, very often is using this argument that. Hermitage in all ideologies uh, in last uh, 200 uh, years has somehow maintained certain uh, you know, independence or self-determination towards making art. So it, somehow it becomes in the current oppressive regime in Russia also he's playing out this argument. And uh, I'm in a totally different uh, situation because I'm commissioning works for the public space. So of course I have to work with the city authorities on getting the permissions. And it is inevitably some kind of a double play, you know, because uh, um, all these projects try to, uh, of course, critically uh, engage and uh, somehow uh, we are, but, but, so, and, and, but on the other hand, we have to be in dialogue. So the mediation of these projects is a part of the, of the job at the moment. And of course, we are not, you know, we are not uh, pussy riot. We don't have a courage of being pussy riot. We are somehow seeing, uh, seeing this as a middle way between what is happening now in Russia, which is on one hand an extraordinary elite aesthetics of groups that would never want to be invited to an exhibition like Why Now Pussy Riot, and on the other hand, big apolitization and silencing. So somehow we, we're trying to play between those two. And actually I have one story, but I'm going to allow myself to show you how it's just because I have a fantastic now the debate is finished. It won't keep going with Yeah, well, yeah, so... Can I, can I go back to the point that you were raising, Nato, uh, when it comes to this element of inequality, because this I think is very important. Uh, I think at the core, what's, what's, even though the projects are very different, but what connects our university to the New World Summit, for example, is an attempt to create, through the space of art, an alternative infrastructure, an alternative institution, to re-establish the idea of what the institution at the basis is. For example, the university is a space that acknowledges and explores different forms of knowledge. It's not about administratively separating or judging these necessarily there, it's about creating a public space where, on a common level, different notions of knowledge can be exercised and shared, and etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think that, these, that the artist organization, in that sense, is also an attempt to bring back elements such as social justice to institutions that have lost them. Whether it's a university who is, like, who is forcing us ridiculous loans, or a, a bank that is, that is, that is per functioning in, in taking its uh, members permanently hostage, 
in order to be able to use it. Uh, parliaments that force a consensus out of fundamental ideological confrontation, etc., etc. So the engagement of, this, of artists or the engagement of the space of art is about bringing back social justice there where it lacks. Nonetheless, this starts from a position of, of fundamental inequality. To work as a documented person with an undocumented person is a position of fundamental inequality. To be non-blacklisted and to work with blacklisted is a position of fundamental inequality. But to engage, to rework on the notion of social justice through these alternative institutions is a way to overcome exactly those contradictions. And overcoming those contradictions is where our current uh, institutions, economic and political, fail. So this is, I think, where the element of transformation that Ahmed was referring to is located. Just real quick, because we also I want to get to the um, to our yeah. audience very quickly. Specifically about science universities, as I say, it started with uh, Tate Mother in collaboration with them, and we had an agreement for a year. And I told him in the beginning, look, this is gonna go on forever. I will involve. If you are ready, we will start this project. They said, let's see. So it's towards the end of the project. They said, let's see. <laughs> It was already not a project anymore, and it cannot survive in a, in a format of workshop. So, I told them, you are slow as a very large organization. Your bureaucratic system is very slow. They needed another two years to adjust what happened, uh, I, I understand, and react to it. So, they want to see something is happening first and react, and if it's actually good or bad, or judge afterwards. But it, the, the, the project was about urgency and uh, immediate activation of knowledge and all these other important things we have to do. <laughs> it, we, it was important for me and everybody else taking part and it was really doing immediate changes in their life, most of them got their permits and so on. But they were slow, the project went on. So it was supposed to end and it became an organization in collaboration with many other organizations, institutions. And it's, it has been starting in other places. So, we, I, I could have been after large institutions for that kind of surplus and really not care about the community and no one would ever notice that. So, it's a decision-making mechanism even within a project and we have to deal with it all the time. It's not so different than how the institutions taking this, such decisions like especially sitting together with their people from PR department. Like, I'm not so angry to get the problems. <laughs> Very helpful sometimes. Okay, we're going to take some questions. Oh, someone's waving. Is that, is that was not they a question? They used to get it because we were so animated. That's, that's, that was a question down there. No? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Hi, a um, question for John Stahl and the New World Summit. Um, the, the, um, the rendition of it at the, the Soviet Zal, um, my understanding is you essentially have people who are already in agreement with your ideology speaking, like you had Yang Kamon talking about how arcane and arbitrary the judicial procedures of the war on terror is, and you know, Nancy Hollander talking about how awful it is the Holy Foundation was closed, and, and blah, blah, blah. And I, I'm curious, I mean, I, I love the project, I, I support it 100%, but I'm just curious if you would ever take a, a more dialectical approach and you know, people who are hostile to, you know, I, there's this, I feel that there's, it's sort of like you're preaching to the converted and I know you need that probably in the beginning because it's a very minoritarian view that you're espousing, but I'm curious if you would ever have somebody who like would be against what not Nancy Hollander you know, said and say, no, the Holy Foundation were, you know, evil terror or, or whatever, you know. That's my first question. My second question is, but I think you answered it here a little bit, is like, what's your end game with, um, with the New World Summit in terms of, are you just trying to change the opinion of people in the art world towards terrorism, or are you, uh, I mean, I, I don't know if you can answer that in public, but are you trying to like change something outside of the art world? Like, um, I don't know if you can answer that in public, maybe you can't answer I, I like the challenge to change the perspective of the art world on the issue of terrorism. <laughs> it's, it's very, it's a nice pragmatic aim. But um, um, okay, so the first question: At what level is there an actual oppositional? Is the summit an actual oppositional space? Because we're facilitating organizations that might be considered or might seem to agree when it comes to the excesses of the war on terror, etc., etc. I think from the first summit on, there were quite a lot of oppositional views because organizations that are dealing with blacklisting are not necessarily 
uh, agreeing with each other often find each other's more in the state to put them on. Also, I think it's important that we're not really working on the New World Summit from the idea of a minority platform. Many of these organizations have agency, have actual power, have a substantial uh, gain in a different power monopoly. So these are not just victims, but they are, the, let's say, uh, uh, living memory of that what the state negates, especially when it comes to the relationship between colonialism, democracy and terrorism. I think we're attempting to bring into the public sphere many suppressed histories uh, that sustain our current understanding of so-called liberal uh, democracy. And in the case of the second New World Summit, Professor Cecil, the keynote speaker, who confronted public prosecutors, judges, uh, politicians, etc., etc., was exactly about making visible or confronting people that are blacklisted or someone who has dealt with blacklisting with all the different layers and representatives of the system that is responsible for that blacklisting. But on an equal level, we plead for an absolute ground zero between so-called uh, terrorism and state terrorism. We try to create a space that, that functions from radical equality in that sense. And very quickly, the second question: uh, my end game. Well, I'm very. For me, it has been very important that for the fourth summit that we're organizing in Brussels now, we're also getting a lot of support from our official partner, is the Unrepresented Nations and Peoples Organization, which is a diplomatic group that represents 48 stateless states, stateless political groups uh, worldwide, progress lawyers uh, who are engaged in. Uh, trying to create new progressive visions on international law. So for us it's quite fundamental that there is also an acknowledgement and a support financially, infrastructurally, uh, content-wise from both the field of art, from the field of progressive diplomacy, from the field of politics, from the field of labor unions, similar to the first example of the public parliament. I would want to have the summit to function as a place that gathers these powers and is sustained by a variety of different progressive powers throughout society. Yeah, but maybe it was a question also in the response I was wondering where you kind of separate yourself from liberal concepts creating new audiences or what we know from the old one in so-called audience development by kind of adding new audiences to what is already there and then we kind of bring new audiences in because I mean in a way as far as I know different practices like you do or like Amit did is how when we, we evolve new concepts of publicness and where we can maybe exclude public, not always editing new things, but also saying, okay, we exclude certain public. And that's the new concept because we're not trying to be evolve a new general public, which is not there. And this, I mean, at the end, I said, okay, it's, again, it's a new concept of, okay, we have new audiences, new publics, and we edit and everything. But no, we try to say, okay, maybe we exclude you because for a certain extent, we try to create something new. And then for that, we need to exclude. I mean, not to just add everything new. But maybe I'm. Someone want to take that off. I'm not sure I totally understood it, but I think, I think there's such a variety of projects that they all have different audiences. And, and in my mind, it's this multiplicity of different directions. And, and Joanna's projects are happening on the street, right? Um, so that's a wide audience. Uh, some of them need to have a very small audience because otherwise they won't achieve their aim. So I think it's about being very specific. And there is, a, I would say, a variety depending on what you know, never just to say a kind of funny thing about the art world, it's never had a problem having small audiences. Uh, it's kind of in its nature. I mean, it's also kind of in the style of it. It's, it we tend to kind of be populist in our politics, but kind of uh, snobbish in our behaviors. So it's like, I, you know, to me, I think that if I were to, if you were a doctor looking at the art world, you wouldn't be like, oh my god, it's a problem with small audiences or like discerning audiences, although I, I appreciate your point. But just to say, you know, I think this kind of craze about the new, new publics may seem a little jar jargony and not full of kind of content. But that said, on a really tangible level, it's interesting to say something like with the silent university or with these projects that we're talking about, the audiences that are available to them, a lot of people think they have no relationship to the art world, and then when they hear immigrant groups that hear about these projects, suddenly see, recognize a kind of sense of solidarity that is a powerful kind of new audience. And we're, you know, I think like strategic new audiences has a very um, powerful democratic project behind them that is really incumbent on us to take seriously. I think our audiences for the kind of um, political efficacy of some of the works that we have, or, or problems, 
is much bigger than we allow ourselves. So, I'm, you know, for me, I'm a big fan of more people because, let's face it, we got big problems. I have a question. I would, I would like to plug in into what Ahmed was saying about transformation and um, also what, about what Johanna was talking about because the manifesto is um, not a specific case. And uh, what I would like to stress actually is the notion of local specificity because what we're talking about, because manifesto started with this huge conflict about participate or not participate. Participate or withdraw because of the law uh, about so called homosexual propaganda. So later on, the situation has only degraded. So now we have a war. And I just wanted to stress that how difficult it is to work in this situation. And for you probably all know, but for those who don't know, uh, the Russian Minister of Culture recently issued a writing, a kind of like a decree, defining culture in Russia. And culture has to be orthodox and it has to be national. So, which makes manifesta kind of like a lost uh, resort of contemporary art in Russia at all. Because I understand that, that there have been a lot of kind of controversy and, and, and discussion about what, what is happening, how it is happening, so and what is the local added value. And I really strongly believe that for the local audiences, it is very important what is happening because uh, in the current political situation, the current political situation is degrading like further and further. So basically what we have today, so manifest that is what would happen contemporary art at all. So uh, that's what I wanted to say, and it is quite important because we have people who withdraw, we have people to, who to, to stay, and 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 uh, it is a kind of kind of an important issue to discuss, I think. Because uh, we are lucky to have a critical audience now. I'm filming in the. Uh, when I see you talking, every time I see this apple. Uh, so uh, I would like to question the professionalism of the critical people here. How come uh, you you talk about criticality and all this, and then I see apple? What is that mic? What's the brand of that mic? <laughs> You're right. That apple thing is outrageous. But, you know, we really got to. I was thinking there needs to be a tape that you put over it that changes. But you have to look. You know, you have to look the details. Uh, for example, you have been looking the sponsor of Sydney Biennale. Did you look the sponsor of the Berlin Biennale? Now you speak about the now, now here, and the urgency. The problem with this uh, urgency is that uh, artists are not trained to work with urgency. It's like if you play tennis, you have machines that uh, train you to smash the ball. So you get 50 times you get the ball to smash it. So when the ball comes, you are ready. Artists are not ready to work with uh, urgency or emergency. So first is a question to train the, train the artwork to be able to react in time. And this is an education plus a training. And then we have another problem, it's the uh, institution or uh, where to exhibit it. Uh, it's not possible to be unpredictable in the, in the artwork. So uh, uh, urgency and here and now is not possible because unpredictability is forbidden in the art world. So we have two, two things to change. Train the artist to, to, to react in time and make the elastic the make elastic the institution. So this is possible. And this is only possible if you have formats that help you to uh, make it possible. So they are ready, it's like an elastic. That was my question. Answer? Yes. You're gonna listen and answer? <laughs> Yeah, it's better. It's better. You should have done that earlier. If this was our biggest concern, I wish this was our, our biggest concern and we could easily deal with this. But uh, there are really uh, other really urgent concerns. Um, yeah, this is the blame comes, right? Like no clean money or wherever you touch, there is something and it was out of my control, right? This logo being here and I happened to not pay attention. But 
Am I supposed to pay attention every little detail like that and try to be, or is it a collective responsibility, everybody in this room? So again, I've been giving this example because it's the best example I give. Uh, uh, like I like uh, recently happened. Uh, uh, he, Iranian Kurdish refugee being deported from Sweden last month. He is in an uh, in airport in, to take the plane to Tehran. And uh, he need to explain the situation in like maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes to everybody. Like, you know. And everybody has to listen to him and it's an urgent thing to react. Right? So they come up with a genius idea. They all get into the plane and they all refuse to uh, put on their seat belt and the plane cannot take off. So, the only condition that this guy should not get on the plane, so they cannot take that guy on the plane and send it to Tehran, and he's sent back to a detention camp, which is not a good place, but he can't be deported. So how we react to things? We can't know everything, and if it's especially only artist's responsibility, this is so unfair. It has to go through first the ones who hold the power, if they ignore, it comes to the ones others under me, and then it comes to them. But of course we try our best. You can't know everything, and you can't move around at all otherwise. But when you know, if you don't react, the moment you know, the moment you have the position to react, actually also to change things, and if you don't react, then that is wrong. And usually that is what's happening. It will remain the moments when they are aware of the problem, like right in front of their face, and they ignore. They can so easily ignore, and that's the problem. It's not the problem that these uh, things are present around. It's the awareness moments, that momentum, and how you handle that momentum. And same for institution, artists, creators, whoever involved in the cultural field. Uh, that and there is no like answer that you want to. No, you can just listen to your heart. It's yeah. fine. Sometimes. I think we have time for one more question. You don't have to know. I'm one more final question? Statement? Intervention? <laughs> Sorry for pessimistic notes somehow. Thank you very much for speaking about the public art because I find it extremely important still. So, uh, in the times when we think that it all happened already, I think that creating the collectivities and the new forms of assemblies uh, involving different communities uh, within the art world is still productive. Yet still I have doubts about some of the projects that have been discussed here, and specifically um, this alternative parliament that uh, you discussed. Uh, we just got to know the elections to the European Parliament. I'm not happy about them, I don't know about you guys, and we don't have to be the same. Yet still, somehow, doesn't the um, idea of externalizing the political power to projects that are completely outside of the institution support the process of those institutions becoming more and more susceptible to the radical right wing? And how would you imagine uh, a, a possible reappropriation of, of whatever you create within the assemblies um, uh, you, you, you work with in, again, in this parliament. There is one more thing that you said that sort of irritated me and I tried to make my irritation productive, so, <laughs> which was that the refugees who spoke in this parliament in Amsterdam uh, recently, that they for the first time declared as political subject. Well, I must oppose to that. Because Amsterdam, and Holland in general, was a place where some 10% of the immobilities were squatted, still in 1980s. And squatting means that people define themselves as citizens, regardless of their legal status, documents, uh, origins, etc., by taking over the public space, the houses, and installing themselves in them. So my question is, why are we so far away from those forms of defining ourselves as um, individuals, as citizens, that were so vital still 30 years ago, and whether there is any way of 
proposing within the artwork, and this is a general question to, to, to all the panel, whether there is any way of actually, instead of flying away and repeating this Peter Pan kind of my utopia with my colleagues uh, sort of things, why and how can we uh, go back to the politicality in the strong sense, including the institutions, including the um, non-institutionalized forms, etc. So how resistance can be still possible on a collective level, not just individualized, uh, neoliberal, uh, uh, acceptable one. And thank you again for the point, sorry if it sounds kind of strong, but it's a last question, so I have to make a point. <laughs> It's an epic question, that's true. <clears throat> um, so, thank you for the question. Then uh, I'll start with the last one. Your question about the presence of We Are Here, the collective of undocumented migrants in the parliament of Amsterdam. Uh, well, first of all, that was on their request. They had already for quite some time wanted to have to be uh, acknowledged, or at least to participate in the, to discuss directly with politicians the situation in which they have been. Uh, Yunus was Mandur, the main representative himself has been living as an undocumented in the Netherlands for more than 10 years. Um, and about 30 years ago, it was actually possible when you were a refugee in the Netherlands, even if you were undocumented or not recognized as a citizen, it was possible, for example, to get access to alternative forms of labor, to education, to vote even. And all of these uh, things have been stripped. Uh, this equal, or at least an element of equal citizenship, or equal representation through political structure, even when you're not an acknowledged citizen, uh, has been stripped. So, we were also confronted within the parliament, working together with the, with the, the parliament of Amsterdam, that there were also many restrictions because many politi political parties opposed um, support to We Are Here, let alone that they would want to have them as an acknowledged political entity in the parliament itself. So even though I agree that uh, the acknowledgement of we are here as a fundamental political party still suggests, not only suggests, still acknowledges uh, an, uh, a disalignment, how do you say it, a disbalance of power, that's obvious, uh, still within the current political climate that already means an enormous amount. Having access to healthcare, having access to political representation, having access to education, that makes a lot of difference, even if you do not have a passport yet. So that is not the end goal, the end goal should be equal citizenship by definition, but within the circumstances that was a concrete gain that we are trying to get from uh, this specific resolution that was developed together with Annette. And then the second question, um, if, we're, if the, the alternative parliaments of the New World Summit are not actually helping either the rise of populism or are uh, kind of disengaging themselves by calling themselves non-parliamentary non or nomadic parliaments or whatever. I think what I tried to emphasize in the first statement that I made is that I work directly also with political parties, with unions, with other forms of political action groups. Uh, I help also to, to create campaigns to try to win within that existing infrastructure as much agency as possible to build upon new alternative parallel political infrastructures. That latter is the goal. But the goal can only take place if we're able to, to build broad coalitions between progressive forces throughout society. And my question is, can art be, can the imaginative force of art be leading in creating that coalition, creating the, the conditions, the visual, the means of visual representation to make that coalition uh, a possibility? So for me, the, the addressing politics, the pragmatic politics of the moment now, and the potential of parallel new infrastructures go hand in hand. I just wanted to add one note to, to, to Jonas' uh, um, statement that actually also what you are addressing, Jonas, is uh, the, the very terms and conditions of art because I don't think that New World Summit could possibly happen in the uh, political foundation per se. When you did it the first time, it was also happening under the auspices of art and precisely under the uh, paragraph 5 of the Constitution of Freedom. Uh, of expression and, and freedom of speech. Uh, uh, so this first summit was happening in Sofia and Zara and somehow bringing on the agenda something that should be maybe debated in the, uh, in the other political public realm that started within art. So somehow art became also a database of recontextualization. And I think both in Jonas and other projects, it's, uh, on one hand, of course, it's a political agenda, political context, but also very strong uh, Conviction of how to engage with the specificity of the field, challenging this resolution.
Yes, and, and so maybe just as a last as a, as, a, as, a, as a last thing to as a last thing to add, because I think that the, the, this, the separation there is no fundamental separation between art, politics, and, and theater. These are each other's mutual earth ground. Our whole understanding, the performative understanding of politics, its social choreography, its visual representation, these all fall in the potentially fall in the domain of visual literacy of artists, of architects, designers, etc. So to, to relocate power, to reshape power, to redefine power is something in which art can be leading, not serving. And that's also what the parliaments are trying to uh, claim. I think that's a very beautiful ending. Um, thank you so much, everybody, and thank you to the audience.